I don't know about where you are, but where I am in Simon's Town, it's lovely and bright, but it's jolly, jolly chilly, and there's quite a wind blowing. So hopefully you're all wrapped up warm and feeling good. Still nice and safe. Um, as I've been saying all through this, I've tried to chat to as many members as I possibly can. And everyone is, is really in good spirits, getting fed up with it a bit now, but good spirits, doing as much as they possibly can to make sure that they are safe and well during the pandemic. But well done, all of you. I'm, I'm really proud, proud of our members. Um, just to say, the board is still working very, very hard to do things virtually for you, racking our brains to find interesting subjects. So if you have anything that you think might be of interest to your fellow members, please pass it on to us. We'd be very, very grateful. Also, our directors are just about to come out. Um, I might be letting out state secrets, but hopefully we're going to be finding a way, watch your emails and things, please, to get them distributed to you. Um, so let me just say, we're gonna have a lovely meeting today, I think, with, the, with Helen, Dr. Helen Muir. She's a very interesting lady to speak to. She's very up on what's going on and she'll be able to chat to us about all sorts of things that are topical. And then also she's very kindly agreed to do a Q and A afterwards. So if there's anything worrying you or anything you need to ask about, please feel free to speak to her. She's more than welcome to talk to you and put your fears at rest. Okay, ladies, may I hand over to Shelley to introduce Dr. Helen Muir. Morning, morning, ladies. Lovely to see. Well, I can't see you, but I know you can see me. And it is an absolute great privilege of mine to introduce Dr. Helen Muir to you. I have known Helen for most of my life. We go back to about for about eight years. However, so let's get on to it. Dr. Muir is an integrated medical pr practitioner actively involved in health and wellness with over 38 years of medical school. She earned a medical doctor degree at the University of Kellenbach, has added traditional homeopathy qualifications from the UK, her interest grants into integrative oncology, nutrition, and the genetics of wellness. And she focuses on patient health, where traditional techniques fall short. And Helen has been appointed as a worldwide medical director of health optimizing. And without further ado, I want to hand you over to Helen because I do not want to take any of her valuable time. We are extremely privileged to be able to have Helen. She is a sort of a speaker worldwide. So Helen, thank you so much for giving up your valuable time to be here with us. We've got a waiting room full of people eager to, eager, eager to hear what you have to say. I think we all had enough of this. Uh, this um, my brain sometimes doesn't want to work anymore. Uh, this pandemic or pandemic, as some people are calling it. So we want to hear how, how you can help us um, deal with all the stresses of what's going on in the world right now. So Helen, over to you. Thanks, Shelley. Um, I'm going to share my screen, ladies. So here we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, ducks. All right. So I know that we're all fairly new to this. Um, virtual world that we're all living in. But I just want to thank uh, Shelley and Amanda and Sue for inviting me to chat to you all today. I'm just setting my little timer because unfortunately I can get carried away with this topic because I'm absolutely passionate about health and wellness. So sometimes you've just got to put a sock in it because I just don't want to stop. So I think I've got about 45 minutes, 40 minutes that we can chat and then we can do some Q and A's. Obviously I can't do consultations over the, the air, but if there's anything that you're not sure about, I will try and answer that. But I thought I would just give this as my, um, as my title to the talk today, because I think that especially now during lockdown, we've all been so isolated. And I was thinking um, the, in the week when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about is I think we all feel a little bit like an iceberg at the moment. You know, we've got this little, this little tip that's showing at the top of the water, but what is actually going on underneath? How are we feeling? Are we all frustrated? Are we um, 
irritated? Are we calm? Has lockdown been fantastic? Because I've even had one of my male patients say to me, Helen, lockdown has been fantastic for me. For the first time in my life, I'm actually connecting with my daughters. You know, so, so not everything has been bad about lockdown, but I think a lot of us are extremely frustrated. Um, you know, whenever you hear about um, them talking about the, the, when they close the schools again, you know, my, my um, feminist came out terribly because all of the, the um, leaders are saying, oh, you know, the working moms are so irritated because they have to be back at work and now they've got to teach the children again. Why are the men not teaching the children? You know, I mean, it's sort of like it, my, the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I thought, you know, this is still how it is, is the woman must be, you know, working. She must be the mom. She must be the teacher now. And then she's still got to put a black negligee on tonight and say, love, I'm all yours. You know, and I just thought this is the tip that we are in Women's Month. We are now this sometimes beautiful iceberg, but really is the Titanic about to crash into it because there's a lot more going on beneath the surface. And how can we actually look at that? So I'm just going to see if I can move this on. Okay. So I, I love this picture of um, the iceberg and the whale and the penguins and the ship about to go into it. Doesn't quite look like the Titanic. But I thought I'd, I'd talk around this sort of theme of that little tip is really where I was trained to work. As a doctor, I was trained to just treat disease. So when you got your diabetes, when you got your hypothyroidism, when you got your cancer, when you got your blood pressure, I could treat you. But what happened in those 10 to 15 years before you got your dis-ease, when your biology was becoming dysfunctional, when you started getting tired, when you started getting all the symptoms of thyroid disease, and you'd go to the doctor and they draw the blood and they say, no, Mrs. Smith, your thyroid is absolutely fine. But I'm feeling terrible. No, 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 there's nothing wrong with you. We've checked your blood and there's nothing wrong with you. And that is where I became so disillusioned because I went from a very academic research background, but I was working with radioactive P32. And so when I got pregnant, I thought I can't work with radioactivity because it's going to go into my baby's bones. So I went into general practice. That was long ago, 1991, but even in 1991, all of my patients were asking, Helen, is there not something other than antibiotics for my children every month when they get sick? And is there not something else other than Prozac for my stress? And I didn't have anything. So I am so grateful to my patients who have been lifelong teachers to me. Um, I am a lifelong learner. I love learning. Uh, I always say I'm actually a bit of a nerd because I love academics. But the big thing is, is that we have teachers all around us. And I think this is also one thing during lockdown that we need to be looking at. Try and slow things down so that you can actually take note of what's going on. Feel what's going on beneath the surface. Have a look and see how big is my iceberg and can we actually do anything about it. So I want to look at the lifestyle, the behavioral side the psychological and motivational side. And then, of course, most importantly, is how do we handle the stress during this time of lockdown? Are there things that we can do? So I'm going to look at that a little bit more. So just to get the whole corona thing out of the way, um, you know, this COVID-19 pandemic, can you believe it's been more than four months? But what I want to say to you all, and I think a lot of us are frustrated with it, is that at least 60 to 70% of us are going to contract it. We're going to get the virus. If it's not this year, it's going to be next year or the following year. This virus is not going to go away soon. It's going to be around. So the big thing for me that came out of this pandemic was that at last people are going to look after their health. And that's what I've been trying to do my whole career is getting people to look at optimizing their health. I've been extremely fortunate in being able to almost manifest the perfect career for myself. Because if I look back on my career, everything has led to this point where I have now been um, headhunted to be the medical director of Health Optimizing Global. And if you want to know anything more about that, I can send you a link afterwards. I'll send it to Amanda and she can share it if you want to know a little bit more about that. I'll just touch on it briefly. But really what it's about is how do we actually get to triggers and causes of things that make your, your health 
become a little bit wobbly and a little bit bad? And how can we stop you becoming ill when you get the coronavirus? Not if, when. So how do we stop you getting really ill from the coronavirus? And that's what I really want to talk about today. So most of us are just going to get a mild flu-like illness. 5% of people are going to be critically ill. We still are talking. I was just saying to Sue earlier on that I was attending a webinar last night by the professor, professor of pediatric pulmonology from Pretoria University last night. And they are still talking personal distancing, masks and hygiene. I like to look at the hygiene really, really effectively. So everyone takes their shoes off before they come into the door to make sure that we haven't got the droplets coming in, making sure you wash your hands the minute you get home. Don't touch your face when, you, when you're out in the shops. Um, masks are always um, controversial because a lot of people get really irritated and they're actually touching the mask more than they are actually having the mask on their face. But we've also seen that the critical Ill pa critically ill patients have had two to three comorbidities. And we know that the big ones are obesity, diabetes mellitus, so when your sugar's out of control, high blood pressure, heart and lung disease, and of course, immunocompromised patients. So in South Africa, those would be our patients with cancer that are on treatment, our TB patients and our HIV patients who are on medication and some who aren't. They are going to be at risk. But it was interesting when we looked at the statistics coming out of Cape Town really early on in the, in the pandemic, we actually saw that the obese patients and the diabetics and the hypertensions had more deaths than actually our immunocompromised patients. Is it because our immunocompromised patients are a little bit more careful? We're not sure, but it does seem that these um, diseases of lifestyle and chronic inflammation, which we can actually do something about, are the ones that are really suffering the most. And in South Africa, we know that 70% of women and 50% of men are actually overweight and obese. And I'll chat a little bit more about that. So if we look at chronic inflammation and metabolic diseases, which are putting us at risk, what can we do about these? So I want to talk about chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation is what underpins most of these metabolic illnesses, but also most of your diseases that we experience, whether it is asthma, whether it is eczema, whether it is arthritis, autoimmune disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, these are all diseases of inflammation and chronicity. So what can we do about them? So if we just look at chronic inflammation, oh, and by the way, um, you know, you're very welcome to get copies of the slides um, from Amanda afterwards. I have sent her a PDF, um, and I think she is um, recording the, the, um, the meeting for those who weren't able to attend but you're very welcome to, to get a copy. So, because I like to, these are not the only things that lead to chronic uh, inflammation, but these are the ones that I feel are probably very relevant. They're easy to do something about, but also if you just take a quick snapshot, what did Helen say about inflammation? What are the things I need to be looking at? Have a look at these six first. If this does not make a difference to your health, you could always go and look at, at the, the, the other things that lead to inflammation. But these, I would say, would be the, the ones that we need to be looking at first. So I always like to look at environment, how you're sleeping, how your stress levels, what is your weight, because we know that being overweight is a big problem during this pandemic. And then the other important thing is exercise and, of course, diet. What are we doing? Because I've had a look. I always, it's terrible, but I always look at everyone's trolleys when, we, when I'm in the pick and pay or the Willie's queue, and I'm actually horrified. The one day I watched a lady pack 10 two liter cool drinks in to the, her basket in varying flavors and um, five of the, from Woolies, that big muffin pack. I mean, I, I had to actually bite on my hand to stop myself saying to her, are you aware what you're doing to your family with that? Because we know that during the pandemic, sugar is, is a big one that is going to affect your immunity. So let's have a look. I'm going to go through them all one by one. And what can we do about them? And what should you be looking at? So I'm not sure where all of you are living. But in the Western Cape, one of our big problems is that a lot of us have encroached on farming areas. 
So we've got these beautiful uh, estates on golf courses, on vineyards. But unfortunately, these are working environments. They are being sprayed with pesticides and fungicides and herbicides. And I really, really encourage you to have a look at what is going around at home. Have a look. Have I got any spray drift coming in? Because remember, even though I know we were chatting about the wine earlier on in our poor wine farmers, they are going to be hot, be start spraying in October. It's usually depending on the weather they start spraying in October and they're going to spray every two weeks. Please make friends with your farmer. He was there before you went and, and moved into your beautiful estate home. Make friends with him and ask him, please, to let you know when he's going to spray. Because then what you're going to do is you're going to close your windows while they're spraying. The workers only work during the day. And when you get home from work or in the evening, you can open the windows. Please bring in your dog's water bowls and food bowls. I've already been invited to speak at a veterinary congress on cancer because of the terrible increase in um, cancer in our, in our pets and animals. And we forget that they are also at risk from these environmental toxins. So bring those in. If you've got small children and you've got jungle gyms or swings in your garden, remember if you've had spray drift to please rinse them down because that pesticide or herbicide or fungicide is going to be on that equipment or in your garden for at least two weeks before the die-off happens. That's why they spray every two weeks because the die-off takes about two weeks. So please think about these things. Inside your home, remember now, a lot of us, um, we weren't allowed to have our housekeepers. We're very fortunate in South Africa. I know this is an international meeting. So a lot of you grew up in countries where there was no one to help you um, with the cleaning of your home. But we're very spoiled in South Africa that we're able to have housekeepers. But now during lockdown, a lot of us are not getting to all those little corners where our housekeepers did. So there's a lot of dust. So what's going to happen with the dust is your child or you are going to get swollen mucous membranes in your nose because you might have a dust allergy. And then the virus can get in more easily. So just be careful. Have a look at places where you are going to spend a lot of time. So that would be your bed. So you hopefully are sleeping seven to eight hours. Just check that the environment around your bed is dust free. Your lamp, you know, your lampshade, when last did you dust it? Your little side table. Have a look, especially at the wire going from the lamp to the wall. You might have one of those, those um, plugs where it sticks out from the wall and there's a lot of dust collecting on it. You might have a lot of dust on, your, um, on the wood uh, at the bottom, at the flooring. So have a look at that. Be very careful about things like that in the home. Exactly the same with the workplace. You might be going back to work now and your workplace might not be as clean as it used to be. They might be spraying a lot of alcohol all over the show. I know a lot of people have got these funny spray things that are happening. A lot of those are toxic to us. So be careful about those kind of things. Be careful about the air that you're breathing. So if possible, you want to make sure that everything is dust free and, it, and there's no pesticides or pollution in the air. Um, also remember that a lot of the workplace environments have now been closed. So the air conditioners have not been on. Those air conditioners need to be cleaned now before we start spraying all of that stuff that is collected in the last four months in those air cons. So think about little things like that. If you yourself has got, have got an air con, Make sure that you clean those little, um, they're very easy to clean. You just slip them out and you can clean them with some organic cleaner and that will make a huge difference. Um, I can never talk enough about water. Unfortunately, South Africa is a third world country. We have a lot of informal settlements around our catchment areas. And because 98% of our population cannot afford to purify, we have to put a lot of chlorine in the water because we have cholera, we've got typhoid, we've got E. coli, hep B, clostridium, type, um, HIV. All of these are in our water. So for our community, our compromised community who are not able to purify their water, we have to put lots of chlorine in. So you'll always notice in the newspaper, they'll say Cape Town has the cleanest water in the world. It's clean because it's got three to five times more chlorine in it than the rest of the world. And that's why often your children don't want to drink water because they've got a very sensitive smell 
and they can smell the chlorine when they want to drink it and it smells like swimming pool water and they don't drink swimming pool water. So the most important thing is if you are able to never, 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 never drink tap water, only drink purified water. Um, be careful of plastic, uh, especially for us women, because unfortunately, a lot of the plastics, you know, we've got no control over where they were bottled, how long they've been on the back of a, um, a pickup van in the sun with the plastic leaching out. And the other important thing is that anything that is that has to stand on the shelf for longer than a few months, they have to put a preservative in it. But the preservative is usually isopropyl alcohol, which is a direct carcinogen to the breasts. But because it's parts per billion lower than they need to label, they don't have to tell you about it on the label. So only drink bottled water if it's an emergency. Rather take your own purified water from home with you when you go um, to visit someone or if you're going shopping or whatever, and then you can take it in a glass bottle. So that's a really important thing about water. And then, of course, animals. A lot of us have had our pets with us now in our homes a lot of the times the animals have become the friends for our children because there's no friends. So you're going to see your children are going to be hugging the dogs more. I know my dog is getting at least a hundred more hugs a day than she would have got when I was at work. So please remember to deworm your animals and remember to deworm your family. Very, very, very important. And then the other thing is personal care and hygiene, because I think a lot of us, are really, I don't know how your hands are feeling, ladies, but you know, I'm over 60, so I'm always worried about my hands. So I, I feel like I can't get them moisturized enough because wherever you go now, you know, your hands have to get sprayed. And, um, and a lot of the times the alcohols are not actually very um, safe for all of us. So please be careful about that. And if you are sensitive, if you have a compromised um, health problem, like for instance, you've got cancer, Rather get yourself a, um, a cleaning product that is safe for you and your skin. Be careful about the amount of toxin you're actually putting onto your skin. Hope that makes sense. And then I want to get to sleep. So this is a very, very, very important um, slide. And, you know, I could literally talk about sleep for probably an hour. I have noticed um, with the technology that I'm using now, I can actually measure the autonomic nervous system and I can have a look and see how it has been affected. And I've done the, the, the testing on a few um, teenagers and I've been horrified at how their autonomic nervous system has been affected because of lockdown. And I was chatting to a few patients about it, just seeing where people you know, feel there's a problem. Now, your autonomic nervous system is comprised of two parts. So your fight and flight, which is your adrenaline and your noradrenaline, and then your parasympathetic. So that's your sympathetic. And then your parasympathetic, which is recovery and restitution and digestion. So when you're sleeping, you are supposed to be going into recovery and restitution. Now that means that you should not eat for at least three hours before you go to bed. So what are we all doing during lockdown? You know, we're all nibbling on things that we never used to do before. And it just seems like your whole 24-hour day has just become a blur. You're sleeping in the day. You're not sleeping at night. You're eating whenever you want to. Please be careful about this. If you are struggling to sleep properly, make sure you go back to a routine. You need to be getting at least seven to eight hours a night. But also, I've seen a lot of people struggling with insomnia during lockdown. So have a look at your sleep routine, especially the teenagers. I found what they're doing is they're staying on social media till about one, two in the morning, chatting to their mates, and then they're sleeping until 12 o'clock in the morning. Then they're getting up and they're doing their schoolwork. So their whole day has become upside down with the result that their um, parasympathetic nervous system is not going into rest and recovery and restitution. It is actually staying in the digestive mode or that rest and restitution has been su suppressed. So please make sure that you are not snacking before you go to bed, getting your seven to eight hours, but more importantly, getting back into the routine. So I like to chat to my patients about sleep hygiene. So what is sleep hygiene? For you, it might be deciding I'm switching off all technology at 10 o'clock. It might be that you want to have a hot bath with some beautiful lavender, 
um, oils or geranium or something to make you sleepy before you go to bed. You might have a little meditation that you do before you go to bed. But really for me, the important part is getting rid of the blue light. So ideally, the chronobiologists tell us, and we've had fantastic lectures by the chronobiologists. It's really an interesting field to go and Google. But they say that you should always go with the sun coming up and the sun going down. So ideally, you should be looking at the sun coming up in the morning because that sets your biological clock. But more importantly, when the sun sets, you must have all your technology going to the darker color. So whether you prefer the pink or the, or the yellow, make sure that you can set your technology, your phone and your, and your computers to go to that, um, that uh, blue light that gets phased out uh, when the sun goes down. Definitely blue light off by 10 o'clock and make sure that you do that with your teenagers as well. You might want to push them till 11. But please, guys, the new data coming out has shown that anyone under two, um, I know, I think Shelley said a lot of the, the ladies are over 60, but that means like me, you're going to have some grandchildren and we need to make sure that our grandchildren are not doing the blue light because moms are busy. They're putting iPads in front of these children. And the new data is that a child should not be holding a phone or an iPad before they're two because of the danger of the EMF exposure. So, I mean, I don't know how often I've been to restaurants in the past where you see the mom's on the phone, the dad's on the phone, and the child has got an iPad in front of it watching movies. I mean, are we even speaking to each other anymore? So please be careful about the blue light and the exposure that we are um, letting ourselves be exposed to in terms of EMF. Um, the other thing that I could do give a big lecture on would be the whole 5G thing coming up. Please be careful about that. I know a lot of people think that we're conspiracy theorists when we talk about 5G, but I'm really, really, really concerned about the 5G that's getting rolled out in Cape Town. Um, if you just use a trimeter and you go and measure at um, my um, son and daughter-in-law live in Hart Bay and one of our um, colleagues um, who's on our EMF group, he actually measured um, the EMF around one of the big shopping centers then it was scary how it was way over the charts so we're not sure where they're going to plant the 5G first we is already in Cape Town and I'm wondering if this has also not been linked to the insomnia that we're seeing during lockdown the other thing that I want you to please make sure that you do with sleep is to make sure that you switch off your Wi-Fi it makes a huge huge difference just switch it off at the plug before you go to bed at night um, you probably will have your teenagers um, being really upset with you because they want to stream and Netflix all the way through the night. But just say that's the way it is. They can watch their movies during the day if they need to. But I found that that has made a huge difference to my patients if they just switch the Wi-Fi off at night. The other thing is that there are a couple of sleep aids that you can use that are natural. You don't have to go with sleeping pills. Just please remember that the two worst tablets for memory are sleeping pills and tricyclic antidepressants. So tricyclic antidepressants are the old ones like the trepolines. A lot of people take them for pain as well, low dose for pain, but they're extremely bad for, for uh, your memory, but especially sleeping tablets. The good news is that the, as soon as you stop the sleeping tablet, your memory does come back. But the, you need, if you are struggling with memory, just have a look at what you're taking to go to sleep at night. There's some great natural remedies. You can do the L-theanine, taurine. Um, the Redormin is a great one made by Flordis. Um, have it, speak to your, your um, health shop uh, attendant. They can help you a lot with some natural sleep aids. Even just natural things like um, um, the oils, you know, your uh, geraniums and your Lavenders are, are great for helping you to sleep. You can just put a couple of drops of lavender on your pillow. So have a look at natural sleeping aids. You don't have to go with a drug route. If you are on a sleeping pill and you want to stop it, the good news is, because I'm sure that a lot of you have been on sleeping pills before and you've tried to stop them and you just couldn't. The good news is that the world record for not sleeping belongs to a Green Beret soldier from the States and it was 17 days. So if you do want to come off your sleeping pill, you could 
you could slowly start reducing it and, and taking a natural one in the meantime, or you could just go cold turkey and decide, okay, I can do 17 days because then you're going to be in the Guinness book of records for the longest no sleep, but it will get better. That's the good news is that you will sleep again. It's just that you need to get off of those things if you've got a memory problem. All right. And then the big one at the moment, of course, is the, um, is the stress. I think that this has been one of the big things that I've seen. And um, I think that for me, the big one has been, um, you know, what has happened in, in families and just in that personal workspace, because a lot of people are having to work at home now. So, and if you look at a new family, like my, my son and, and my daughter-in-law have just had their little baby who's now four months old. My son is a, is a biomedical engineer, so he needs a place where he can work in the quiet, but their little apartment only has one living space and two bedrooms. There isn't a place for a little office. So what do we do in these cases? You know, I think that's probably a new business now is having these hot offices where you can go just in and out and, and rent a little space. I think that's going to be a new industry. But these are the things that are going to frustrate people because you're going to have dad working from home or mom working from home and the kids are running around, the dogs are running around and, you know, you're having to clean and teach and do all of these things in one space. You need to be able to have some kind of a routine that there is some semblance of um, calmness in the, in the home. So, you know, it could be something that could be a family um, affairs. How do we do it? You know, get the kids to actually be involved in that is how can we, we improve things like this if someone does have to work and the family has to study um, and things like that. I don't think it's insurmountable. We're all going to have to be really um, flexible right now during lockdown. And, you know, I think a lot of good things will come out of it. And I'm sure that in this group, you've probably got some people who've got some really great ideas about how one can actually get around these things. The other important stress factor, of course, is that a lot of people have lost their jobs. And a lot of people are in severe financial distress. And, you know, I wish we could all do more about that. I know you guys are doing some amazing work with, um, Sue was saying that now, because you're not having to rent rooms, you've got more money that you can spread around to these stressed areas. And I just feel that if we can help, we all have to do our little bit. Um, I wish I had solutions to the work and financial situation. And I think... Um, we've all got to try and push that this lockdown, you know, really starts getting loosened because people need to get back to their jobs. Um, you know, I'm very glad to see that a lot of the people who are, who live from a day to day salary are getting back into the workplace as well. The other important stress factor, of course, has been lockdown. I think isolation has been, has been a very big factor. I know for myself, my mum lives with me. She's 86. And she's got a, a sanguine personality. So that means she just loves people. And we all sitting in our offices working. Um, so we can't, you know, sort of chat to her all day. Her friends were always the people that she met when she did our shopping and when she went to the hairdresser and when she went to Bible study and when she went to her church on a Sunday morning. All of those have stopped. But the most important thing for her is that everybody is now wearing a mask and she has severe deafness. She has hearing aids, but because she's so deaf, she also lip reads and now she's not able to lip read. So when she goes to the shops now, she can't do her normal chat to the lady behind the counter. She's got friends wherever she goes in all the shops that she normally shops at. She's got friends there. And now she's not able to do that because she can't see them speak. So she can't hear, especially in a noisy shop. So she's extremely stressed and frustrated because of the isolation. Because of um, the fact that it's been winter, I don't let her go out into the cold and exercise. So she does all her steps around the garden. Luckily, she's incredibly healthy. But a lot of us are not being able to exercise as much as we used to. And this has also led to an extremely high frustration level. Because we know that what the psychiatrists always say when they write a prescription for an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety tablet, they teach us, put exercise at the top of the, of the um, prescription for any psychiatric condition. 
because exercise is important because it helps reduce those um, levels of um, the stress hormones. With a lot of frustration around, not only with the adults, but also with the children and with um, even you know, colleagues and friends that we're having to interact with on social media and on Zoom when we're having work meetings. A lot of the time the frustration is coming out because everybody is stressed and we are having to be very careful about even those workplaces where we are extremely frustrated that we don't vent uh, unnecessarily and, and hurt someone's feelings. So be careful about that. For my mum, her spiritual life has been extremely badly affected because she's not allowed to go to her church anymore. Um, a lot of people might not be able to go to their synagogues or their mosques. But this is a big point, is that one needs to try and get them onto uh, the, the uh, live feeds because a lot of the people have had live feeds, but the older people might not know how to do that, you know, so it's incredibly important that these, these things, we, we try and help people who are not able to. I found during um, lockdown, one thing that really helped us a lot was to do our meditations frequently. So instead of just doing it in the morning, maybe do one in the evening as well. If you're feeling frustrated, just take some time out, go sit in the garden and just take five minutes. Play some beautiful music, just quickly do a five minute meditation. There are lots of them online. Mindfulness is one of the things that I really, really um, uh, love. And there's a lot of really good coaches on that. Um, uh, you know, these are the things that we need to be practicing during this time. Just become mindful. Just slow everything down instead of just, you know, getting yourself heat up the under the collar and then you're actually just venting. And if you need to, look up a coach, look up a psychologist, look up a counselor. It might even just be your pastoral counselor at your church. But get some, if you really feel like you're not coping, get to someone, get some help. Because a lot of these people are doing online and zoom uh, calls so it's not like you can't get to them you can actually do it um, over internet as well and then of course i talked about with inflammation i talked about how important your weight is now for me this is an incredibly important thing because we know one of the um, uh, lectures that we had about two weeks ago was that uh, by physician in um, near hermanus he was actually giving us data on how a body mass index of only 28, that is not obese. Obese is one only over 30. So between 25 and 30, you overweight. That even with a BMI of 28, you have a much higher risk of mor morbidity from the coronavirus. And this was really shocking to me because, you know, I would have, I think probably all of us are sitting at about 27 to 28 after lockdown because we've been having too many carbohydrates and we haven't had enough exercise. So for me, that's a really important thing. So please get on the scale, check how much you weigh, and if necessary, get your BMI back down below 25. Really, really important to save you from the mobility of the coronavirus. So how do we control our weight? There are a lot of really great programs. You know, getting thin is not the problem. It's easy to get someone thin. The big problem is keeping someone thin, and you need to be able to reset your metabolic goal. So I use a program called Health Point, which I found really good because I can use it with my cancer patients when they've put on weight from cortisone. But there are a lot of great programs out there. But for me, one of the important ones is portion control. Really, really important. So usually protein should be about 100 grams. If you look at that 100 grams and you think, oh my goodness, I'm far hungrier than that, then just put another 50 grams, half of that aside. And in half an hour, if you are still hungry, half an hour from finishing your meal, you can have that second half a portion. I'm willing to bet you that you're actually going to be full because our eyes always overestimate how hungry we are. And then it's on your plate and you're just going to finish it. So have a look at portion control. The other uh, good, uh, big thing is please make sure that you're eating good fats and not bad fats. Um, now with all of the banting being extremely um, prevalent, a lot of South Africans have unfortunately given banting a bad name because they see it as a high protein diet. It is not. It is a high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate diet. But please, with that high fat, try and make sure that most of your fat is in the plant-based form. 
So your coconut oil, your olive oil, your nut oils, your um, ghee, um, your butter, and um, try not to have too much saturated fat from animals. Remember your, your nuts and your avos are also great plant fats. Make sure that you're getting enough protein. You should be having protein with every meal, so three times a day. If you are intermittent fasting and you're only having two meals, definitely make sure that you've got enough protein in those two meals, please. And then, of course, carbohydrates. Um, if you are not moving, you cannot eat a lot of carbohydrates. Remember, carbohydrates are to help us to move. So if you are sitting at your desk all day, all right, I mean, I've got a stand-up desk. I'm sitting now because, you know, we never look good when we're looking down on, on the screen. So my sister said, please, Helen, never give a lecture when you're standing up. It must be when you're sitting down. So um, we all know that we need carbohydrates to help us move. So if you're not moving a lot, sorry, doll, you can't have a lot of carbohydrates. Then rather go low GI. So that means under 50. And they're great uh, um, things on the internet about your, which is low GI and which is high GI. Most of the time, it's going to be your fruits that are going to be a problem. So it would be rather stick to your deciduous fruits. Don't go with your tropical fruits because they are very high in fructose. And we know that fructose is really, really bad for our brains and for insulin resistance. And then, of course, alcohol. You know, a lot of us were using too much alcohol during lockdown because we were rewarding ourselves with it. And then we, it all got cut off. And then we were extremely frustrated because now we couldn't have our glass of wine at night. I mean, you know, I'm sure that at lunchtime after this meeting, you'd all be having a glass of Chardonnay or some Merlot or whatever it would be. And wouldn't that have been nice to all do that together? But the big thing is, is that a lot of people were doing too much alcohol during lockdown. So if you've got a weight problem, please remember that, alcohol, that wine is carbohydrate, gets uh, metabolized like carbohydrate. Your spirits get metabolized like fat. So if you want to have a glass of wine, you then got to take away one of your carbs. So I would say the fruit one. If you want to do a whiskey or a gin, you've got to reduce the fat that you're eating because you're going to have that instead. So you need to do a balancing act with it. Okay, and then exercise. I'm just watching my time here. So um, if we look at exercise, uh, I was reading an article the other day and I thought this was fabulous because it is something that is going to motivate me continuously. It's going to make it a non-negotiable for me. The new data shows that the best anti-aging pill is exercise. They've looked at huge meta-analysis and the people who did the best in their old age were the people that exercised every single day. It doesn't have to be an hour. It can be 30 minutes, but it needs to be 30 minutes daily. If you do not have the time to do 30 minutes, you could do a 15 minute and a 15 minute, at least 15 minutes daily, but preferably 30 minutes daily. And if you could, you could build it up to an hour. So this is our new anti-aging pill, ladies. And I'm sure you're all going to love that because that has been proven now. So walking daily increases your bone mineral density by 5%. All of these fancy um, pills that they give you when you've got osteopenia or osteoporosis, also only increase your bone mineral density by 5%. So just by walking, you're going to do the same as a lot of drug, which is giving us a lot of side effects as well, a lot of us. Remember, as you get older, you need to keep your muscles strong because they also help with our bone mineral density. So even if you just get a little pair of, of um, dumbbells, make sure you keep your your arms nice and toned. Make sure you're doing your, your stomach crunches or your plank. And you know, this can take you 10 minutes in the morning. Go for your walk, do your little arm exercises and do your plank for a minute. You know, all of these are going to be helping you. And more importantly, make it a non-negotiable. Please guys, make it a non-negotiable that you are going to exercise. You know, in Cape Town, it's terrible because what we do is as soon as the rain happens, everyone is inside like a squirrel and we into that little nest and we don't want to budge. You know, you can actually find 30 minutes in the day that it's not raining. You know, we're not getting that soaking rain anymore. So please try and make sure that you get your exercise done. Incredibly good at reducing inflammation, really good at, for your mind and your stress, but most importantly, the anti-aging pill. I'll leave you with that one. And then diet. If we look at diets, I've touched on this already. There are so many 
great diets out there. The Mediterranean diet um, is still probably the main diet that doctors are, are using for their, their patients. Um, just a little caviar about the Mediterranean diet. In my opinion, and there was some work done on this in the States, they were saying that the Mediterranean diet often doesn't work in the United States because people eat in front of the TV and people don't have a social life around the table. If you think of Italy, first of all, they are invariably picking the, fr the food out of their gardens. They are getting rid of all the lectins. So they peel the tomatoes, they deep up the tomatoes, they take the peel off the peppers, they peel a little bit of the aubergine. So they're getting rid of the lectins in the food that inflame us. So there's a, a very controversial book called The Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry. Uh, read it if you've got a lot of arthritis. It makes a huge difference. If you've got an autoimmune disease, massive difference. Worth a try, it's a six-week program. And that looks at the lectins in plants that actually inflame us. Because a lot of us would have gone on to a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, and we still have got pain and we're wondering why. Go and have a look at his book. It's, it's worth it. The other diet that's really popular is paleo. Oh, just another thing about the Mediterranean was they actually found that you need to sit around the table. You need to sit around the table with your family. You need to interact. You need to laugh. That is also part of the Mediterranean diet. And then, of course, don't forget about how, you know, if you look at any Italian chef, they are very liberal with the olive oil. So don't forget about that. And then, of course, we've got paleo, which is the um, early man diet. So that was what they used to eat in the old days. Remember, it's mostly nuts and fruit and vegetables, no grains, no dairy, no sugar, but most importantly, nothing processed. And that's what I always tell my cancer patients. I say to them, shop around the edge of the shop. So if you think of Woolworths, around the edge of the shop are the fruit, the vegetables, the salads, the chicken, the meat, the fish, those kind of things. Those are what you should be uh, buying. If you're a vegan, you're allowed to go down the aisles because that's where the chickpeas and the lentils and things will be. But you want to be shopping mostly around the edge of the shop. Don't go down the aisles because if it's been processed and it's in a bo box, it's probably not good for you. Because if you just think about cereals, what do they do with cereals? Oh, added vitamins and iron. Why do they need to add vitamins and iron? Because they strip the vitamins and iron and the nutrition out of the grain and then they spray it back on. But the problem is that they're spraying on synthetic vitamins, which your body doesn't see as a vitamin. It sees it as a drug, so it has to go by the liver and you pee and poo out 90% of it. So ideally, you want to be getting your, your vitamins from fruit and vegetables. And if you are taking a supplement, make sure it's made from fruit and vegetables. So those are very important points about the paleo. Ketogenic and banting. A lot of people with cancer will do a, a ketogenic diet, especially brain tumors will often use that. And getting into ketosis means you've got to go really, really low on your carbs. Okay, so all the carbs have to be below 40 in terms of the GI. It is very difficult to get um, someone onto a ketogenic diet because it is really, really um, very narrow because they have to eat a lot of fat, very little carbohydrate, which means very little fruit and veg. And most of us actually can't do it for a long time and we lose a lot of weight with it. The other one, of course, is banting, which Prof Noakes made um, incredibly famous in South Africa. Please, if you're doing banting, do it properly. Don't do a high protein banting. Um, I was telling Shelly um, and Amanda when they came and saw me last week about my son who uh, I arrived, he was busy writing exams and we just wanted to say hello and we arrived there and he was um, frying a packet of bacon and three eggs in the pan. And I said to him, Chris, you can't eat all of that. And he said, mom, you don't know everything, I'm banting. So I said, Chris, that's not banting. That is a high protein diet. You're going to get a kidney stone. Mom, you don't know everything. I'm banting. Needless to say, three days later, he had his kidney stone. So please be careful about that. Banting is not high protein. When we had lunch with Prof Noakes, when he was um, giving us a lecture at our last SASM Congress, uh, one of the breakaway uh, lunch uh, venues, he had a tiny little mutton chop, that little one. He had four blocks of butter on top of the, the lamb chop. He had a half a cup of broccoli. That was his lunch. So that is what banting is. Low carb, moderate protein, high fat. Okay. And then, of course, we've got the vegans. Now, unfortunately, with vegans, 
you need to please do vegan properly because vegans also give vegan a bad name because all they do is they eat salad and veg and that's not vegan. You need to be getting good quality of protein in and to get rid of the lectins with all your legumes, you might need to do get a pressure cooker because that reduces the lectin content on the, um, on the, the legumes. Um, also, please remember with vegan that you need to be checking your vitamin B12 and you need to be checking your iron because it's very difficult to get those in, especially as women. And then the other important part that I wanted to talk about was um, during um, co the COVID pandemic, please be careful of gluten, dairy, and sugar. So let's just get the sugar out of the way first. So why no sugar? Because sugar increases your insulin resistance and insulin resistance leads to inflammation, which makes you more susceptible to the comorbidities. The gluten and dairy are actually really, really important to be careful of, especially if you do a lot of them. Because what we know is that gluten and dairy have very, very difficult proteins to digest. So these half digested peptides are actually then in the gut and your body has to scavenge them. So to scavenge them, what they use is they use the same IgG immune system as what your body would need if you were exposed to corona. So rather let your IgG system be available to look after the, the virus, then keep it busy with a lot of gluten and dairy. So please just be careful about that. And then the other thing is that, you know, I'll often have mums say to me, Oh, Helen, I'm so upset. My child is overweight and what can I do and how can I get my child fit? The first question I ask, and I know it's a little bit brutal, is I say to the mum, does your child have a credit card? And they look at me and they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, unless your child has got a credit card, who's buying the food? So if your child is overweight and there are biscuits and cookies and muffins, which is actually just cake in your home, it's because you bought them. And that child needs you to put the house on diet, but more importantly, needs you to set the example. I mean, I've got a lady who said to me, she was struggling with her weight. And I said to her, what have you got in your house that's not good for you? And she said, well, I always keep a packet of biscuits. I said, why do you have biscuits? She said, in case I have visitors. And I said to her, how often do you get visitors in a year? She said, about twice a year. So I said to her, so you're keeping biscuits in case you get a visitor twice a year. You know, go figure. So that's also one of the things that we need to be careful of is, you know, is that house on diet because it's really on diet or is it because you actually want the cookies? The other thing is please try and eat as much organic, pasture-reared and sassy seafood as you can. Right now, there's a lot of these suppliers who are not able to supply restaurants anymore and they are really supplying us with amazing seafood and meat and organic vegetables. So please have a look. I'm sure that with this great group of women, you've all got your favorites. So, you know, that would be something that we can also do to support our farmers and our fishermen and our, uh, the, the chaps that um, supply us with good meat. So have a look at that and try and go as organic pasture as possible. I encourage you to grow at least your greens at home. So do your, your lettuce, do your spinach, um, if you're able to, if you've got a little bit of a greenhouse, you can do your broccolis as well. I just find the white English cabbage moth annihilates all microciferous, but you can actually grow rockets at least. All right. So this is my last slide. Um, I see I've got nine minutes left on my timer. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now. So changing the paradigm of medicine. So, you know, I explained to you that I went to university. I was very, very fortunate in my career to be able to do basic science research at Stellenbosch University. When I finished uh, my Haussmann year, I was working in the Department of Endocrinology with Professor Hoax, um, Professor um, Hoax, and um, I was able to do basic science research at his unit. But then I went into GP practice and I was completely disillusioned with what I was able to offer my patients. You know, seeing 33 patients in an afternoon, nothing apart from regular medicine. And, you know, I was telling you that you've got health, you've got a dysfunctioning biology, and then you've got disease. And I was only trained to treat the disease. I could not do the dysfunctioning biology. And we were very lucky in 95 to be able to study homeopathy here in um, South Africa. The UK um, uh, homeopathic hospital gave us permission for Dr. David Lilly to train us. 
So I, I studied homeopathy for um, three years. So I had another arrow in my quiver. And then in the, in the early 2000s, we were very fortunate that the doctors from um, the States who were the functional medicine doctors came to South Africa and started training us. So now I could help that dysfunctioning biology in the middle. So the health, the dysfunction, and then the disease, I could now fix that dysfunctioning biology and take it back to functioning biology. But I found it kept slipping back and I'd fix it and it would slip back and I'd fix it. I'm sure a lot of you have been to functional medicine doctors who are amazing. So then I went and I studied epigenetics, hoping that would help. So you, we look at the genetic um, SNPs that a patient has and we give them specific supplements to, help, to stop those SNPs getting switched on. So just basic uh, biology. Say, for instance, you've got a family history of uh, Alzheimer's. So that's the APOE4 gene. And you get, it, get the gene from both your parents. So it's homozygous. You still only have a 40% chance of that getting switched on. Now, what do I mean by that getting switched on? That you would get the Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean you're definitely going to get it. Now, epigenetics is a study of what would make that get switched on. So in an Alzheimer's case, alcohol is a huge trigger to that homozygous gene getting switched on. So I looked at epigenetics. I learned a lot about supplements. I learned a lot about activated folate and all those kind of things. And so I got into supplementation to fill that nutritional gap, which we couldn't do with food alone. When I got into that field, I realized that that was another whole massive field that I didn't know anything about. I didn't know the difference between a synthetic vitamin and a food-based vitamin, but I quickly learned that, especially when you've got really sick patients like my cancer patients who are on chemotherapy, you can't give them a synthetic vitamin because it can affect their chemotherapy. So I started looking at food-based supplementation as well. So always look at that. If you do have a problem, fill your nutritional gap, preferably with a food-based supplement. And then I was extremely lucky in 2017, I was phoned by someone randomly and he said, oh, we've got a, a, a health optimizing clinic we want to open outside Paul. Are you interested? And I was really burnt out because of all the cancer patients I was working with. And I said, you know, I'm really interested, but I just don't have time to come now. Short story, I went to see um, Thomas Uxness, who's the founder and director of Health Optimizing Global. And I was extremely fortunate to be able to work at the clinic outside Paul for two years. And then I was, Thomas asked me to be the medical director globally and teach all the doctors. So basically what we do with health optimizing is Thomas um, is now about 45, but when he was young, he was extremely ill. He had severe asthma and hardly ever went to school. So he's self-taught. He's incredibly bright. He comes from a very, very clever family. They're all deans and, you know, professors and whatever. And at 18, his uh, pulmonologist said to him, Thomas, I'm really sorry, but you will never lead a normal life. And he said, do you do realize you're speaking to an oxness and we never take no for an answer. We are solution orientated. Now in Norway, where he comes from, every child drinks a liter of milk a day. And when he started doing his research, he realized that one of the big triggers for asthma is dairy. And he stopped the dairy. He went and, and searched all over the world for a whole lot of technologies. And within nine months, he'd actually cured himself of asthma. He does not even use an asthma pump now. So he managed to get off all of his treatment and he started um, health optimizing, um, which is we do assessments with technology. We do non-invasive treatments with technology and cutting edge treatments. So basically where it would fit in would be, how do we get to the triggers and causes of what makes your biology become dysfunctional so that you end up with disease? So now we can actually stop it right down at the bottom. We still don't have all the answers, but we've got a lot more of the puzzle pieces that we never had before. So I'm really excited about this new paradigm of medicine. Um, we've got clinics in London, we've got clinics in um, Norway, in Bergen and in Oslo, we've got in Gutenberg in Sweden, got in Lithuania at Vilnius, we're opening up one in Slovenia, in Italy and in Switzerland, and hopefully we'll jump across to the United States and to Mexico sooner we're going to build a big research center. There is also a clinic in the Philippines in Manila, but that's closed now during COVID. And the, there was one also just a small satellite clinic in Sydney in Australia as well. 
So we're extremely uh, excited about health optimization and hope it'll go global. If anyone want, of you want to see a little bit more about that, you can go on to www.healthoptimizingblog.com, one word. But the health optimizing is with a Z, like the American spell it. You can see there, there's a Z in the health optimization. So that's all I have today. Um, I'm sorry that it went on a little bit long, but I'm going to hand back to Amanda and hear if there are any questions. Thanks, ladies, for listening. Thank you. Right, I'm going to... Perfect. Does anyone have any questions? If you can either raise your hand or you can send a message via chat. Okay, I see Shelly has one. Um, you must unmute yourself, Shelly. Helen, what is a healthy alternative to Okay, that's a great question. So again, the big thing about the dairy and why it is so, uh, such a problem, especially in children, is that A1 casein, which is one of the proteins in the dairy, can actually go through into the brain and make the kids foggy. So what I like to do is, I always say try and go black, but if you can't, if you really, really can't, do no dairy. So almond milk is one, uh, oat milk is one, and then if you really can't handle any one of the alternatives, um, you could do cream because cream doesn't have the protein. Okay, so it's a protein that is dangerous for us, the casein and the whey. Um, so the casein is the, is the most uh, difficult one for us to absorb, but you could do, for instance, I've got a lot of patients who say, I can't do almonds, I'm allergic to nuts. I can't do, do grains because you know I'm allergic to them. Then I'll say to them, why don't you try doing just a spoon of cream? But then what I want you to do is I want you to bring your cream to the boil so the milk solids, if there are still some milk solids, will fall to the bottom, just the same as you make ghee. And then you can strain it and put it in a sterilized jar and it'll last in the fridge quite long. So I always let them do that if they really can't handle any of the alternatives. But you know, at the moment in, at Woolworths, you can buy unsweetened almond, unsweetened oat. Uh, the health shops and the delis even have quinoa milk. So there's a lot of alternatives to, um, to the, uh, the complete dairy option. You can even make your own almond milk. Just get the blanched almonds or blanch them yourself. And then you just literally, it's one cup of almonds, four cups of purified water. And if you really wanted to have a little bit more flavor, you could add a date or you could add a little bit of vanilla essence. And you just put that into your Nutribullet or your Magimix. And then you put it through a little muslin uh, strainer. And that also keeps for ages in the fridge. So it's very easy. Okay, great. We've got another question asking, what is functional medicine? Okay, so that's a great question. And um, if, you, if you're looking for a functional medicine doctor, you can go onto the SASIM website, S-A-S-I-M, South African Society for Integrative Medicine. There's some great doctors in, in Cape Town, uh, really, really um, great uh, functional medicine doctors. So basically what a functional medicine doctor is, is they're going to do, is they're going to fix the biology. Remember in the beginning, I was talking about um, thyroid dysfunction. So now you go to the doctor for at least five to 10 years before your bloods become abnormal. Because remember the blood is a small part of your body. It's a tiny part of the body that we're measuring. When it is with our technology, we're measuring the interstitial fluid and what's happening in the interstitial fluid, the salty water around the cell, which is a much bigger portion of the body. But in the blood, that blood test is only going to be diagnosing your dysfunctioning uh, thyroid way down the line. But you can have symptoms for five to 10 years before your, your, your um, thyroid function show as abnormal on the blood test. So the functional medicine doctor will go and have a look at what is impacting that thyroid. Why have you got the symptoms? of tiredness, dry skin, lack of libido, weight gain. And they will help fix that dysfunctioning biology before you get the thyroid dysfunction. So it's, it's really about fixing how the body functions. So a lot of gut microbiome work, a lot of thyroid and hormone uh, repair is done like that. Okay. I hope that helps. Yes, we have another question. Um, is hypertension still an issue for... COVID-19 if you are on blood pressure medicines. Mm, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately it is because it's, it, it's working on the ACE receptor. 
And in fact, the prof brought that up last night when he was talking about children with corona, because he said one of the, the reasons why they think children are not getting it badly is because they don't yet have those mature ACE receptors on their cell membranes. So even if you are on blood pressure medication, you are still at high risk. So, you know, if we talk about, you know, I, I'm really keen for everyone to get unlocked and get everyone get back to normal. But I would still be careful with clients who are cancer patients, who are hypertensive, who are obese, who have really bad diabetes. I would be very careful of those clients and I would make sure that they are extremely careful. They could be the ones who, you know, are going to send people out to go and shop for them. That's where we're all going to get this is when we are shopping and with a lot of people. So even if your blood pressure is perfectly controlled, make sure that you reduce the other risk factors. Make sure you keep your sugar normal. Make sure you get your weight down. We also know with blood pressure that the best drug in the world will only drop your blood pressure by 5%. But if you get your body mass index to below 25, say you're sitting at 31 and you get it to below 25, you will reduce your blood pressure by 23%. No wow. drugs. And I think that is the important thing is that medicine is only there to put a Band-Aid on. Give the patient a drug. Give the person a pill. What about, remember if you go back to that little iceberg of mine, what about what's going on underneath the surface? What is happening to the lifestyle? How stressed is that person? Can we get the sympathetic uh, autonomic nervous system back under control? Can we get the weight down? And those unfortunately are difficult to do because it's much easier just to give a pill. But with you, if you have got blood pressure and you're on medication, make sure you reduce all the other chronic inflammatory things that we've talked about today. Okay, great. I've got another one. Uh, are there any natural remedies that can help with Parkinson's? <laughs> Parkinson's is a very difficult um, illness uh, to treat naturally because, as you know, it's a problem with the brain not making enough dopamine. So, and there aren't that many great dopamine uh, alternatives to the drug. So I've never been able to treat someone with established Parkinson's with just natural remedies. But having said that, we have had, when I was in Bergen for six weeks, the beginning of the year, we had a Parkinson's patient who'd come over to Norway from the States and he had really bad Parkinson's. And with the technology that we've got, it really made a massive difference. But I would like to have got him right at the beginning. We know with Parkinson's, um, and maybe I should have said this about the environment, is that there's been an increase of Parkinson's in golfers of 45% because of the exposure to the herbicides on the greens. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, I'm sure that a lot of you are golfers. Um, and if you think about when you play golf, you always want to play golf when there's no wind. In Cape Town, that means you've got to get up early in the morning. That means there's dew on the grass and you only have one gloved hand and the other one is, is bare. So now you're picking your, your golf ball up. It's full of dew. It's full of uh, herbicide. And often you're going to rub it on your clothes. And God forbid I've seen this happening because I come from a golfing family. They lick the golf ball. So they're getting the pesticide in. So huge increase in golfers. I once did a lecture for cancer care um, at the one and only, and there, it was a big fundraiser. And there were a lot of, of uh, high-powered businessmen there. And 10 of them came to me afterwards and said, Helen, you've got to spread the word about this, this golfing thing, because of course, where do we all do businesses on the golf course? So, so for me, it is really, really important. And apparently after that, uh, the guys at Desalsa outside Stellenbosch, which is actually stuck between a vineyard and a golf course, they actually brought in hand wipes and, um, and things that the guys, when they got to the halfway house, they didn't grab their sandwich with the hand that had all the herbicide on it mm -hmm. and you know, would le just leave. So they had wet wipes and things there for the guys to, to clean their hands with. But getting back to Parkinson's, at the moment, I would say there's probably not a great natural remedy for it, sorry. Okay, uh, next one. Do medical aids pay for different therapies? Alternative talking, therapy, it looks like. Alternative, yes. Mm -hmm. So they will. You just have to please make sure that your ICD-10 code is always there. In other words, say for instance, you've got breast cancer. 
Um, so you've got to make sure that the ICD-10 code C50.9 is on your, your invoice. So a lot of the integrative doctors might not have that um, on their system. You just need to ask them. So I've found that as long as I've got the ICD-10 codes on, most of my patients will be able to claim at least a portion of the intravenous vitamin C drips and their supplements and things like that. Obviously, if they've got a nappy code, they get paid more efficiently. Um, even some of the supplements, if you're on a higher option, like if you're on Discovery Executive, they will pay for your Neutralite vitamin supplements or your Metagenics or whatever you're taking, your Zymogens, because a lot of them have got um, nappy codes. Yeah. Okay. Can use of a pure CBD oil help maintain body wellness? Oh, that's such a controversial lecture. <laughs> All right. You know, unfortunately, um, the cannabis plant is also being completely incorrectly used at the moment. Um, you shouldn't be using CBD on its own. That's the bottom line. Because you've got your receptor and you need to have it balanced. So it's got a CBD side and a THC side. And if you just do CBD for too long, you're going to make that neuron jittery and you start going to start becoming paranoid and anxious. So you need to balance it. And that's a lot of the problem now because THC is still not legal. You can smoke it. You can grow five plants in your garden and you can smoke weed, but God forbid you use it medicinally. I mean, it drives me insane. We are getting there. We've got some amazing pioneers who are working and working and working to get it through. Um, but it is a long, slow process to actually get that done. But I would say that I would not use CBD like I would use a food-based supplement, you know, as a daily um, thing like I would use vitamin C. I would use CBD specifically for something. So, you know, your body is going to tell me when it wants something. So it'll give me a symptom of anxiety. CBD really works well for anxiety. But if you're not anxious, why would you just take CBD? I don't, you know, I don't see the, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't believe in treating, um, my, my integrative clients, like I would have done when I was a doctor. In other words, I will wait to, to hear what your body wants, to, wants me to give it. It's the same as menopause. You know, a lot of us have, are going, have gone through menopause. If you do not give me a menopause symptom, I'm not going to give you a menopause drug. You know, because then I'm just doing what conventional medicine does. Oh, you know, you're in menopause. You've got to take a hormone. Make sure you take this hormone until you fall into your grave. Oh, sorry, oops, we gave you breast cancer. So again, there was a fantastic article uh, in the 2005 um, Time magazine on menopause. And the interesting thing about that was that they showed that the most important thing with the woman going into menopause was actually her attitude. And I always say to my patients, because a lot of women will come into my office and say, Helen, I've gone into menopause. I'll say, yes. And I'll say, don't I need a pull? And I'd say, have you got symptoms? No. And I'd say, well, why do you want a pill? And that gets back to the CBD thing. You don't just give a pill, you give it if there's a, if there's a, a reason for taking it. So I always wait for my patient or my client to come in with a symptom and then I'll decide what is the best treatment for that. But I don't think CBD should be taken just as a supplement. I, I think we're going to run into trouble if we do that. Okay. Uh, do we have any, we have one more question. I'm just wondering if there's anybody else that has a question that hasn't typed one via the chat. Anybody else? It looks like, okay. So the last question that we received was, are you available to consult privately? I saw that was Dottie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, Dottie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Dottie, unfortunately, I am... Um, extremely uh, busy with my health optimizing job as medical director. So I'm, I did contract with my, my boss to see one patient a day. But at the <laughs> moment, I think I've got about a two month waiting list because most of them are cancer patients. But yeah, you can, you can get my email address from uh, Amanda. Send me a, an email. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Let me unspotlight you. Thank you so much for all of your, um, your work that you've done and for um, being here for us today in the IWC. You had a wonderful you, talk. I think it'll be helpful for everybody in wellness. And I think Sue has one last thing she'd like to say as well. Um, you must just unmute yourself, Sue. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, Helen. 
just as the president of the IWC for this year, I found that most informative and I want to give you a real big thanks. I know how busy you are as that last little question uh, addressed, um, but it's given us a lot of insight and I'm sure it's been a, a very useful lecture to attend for all our members. So thanks again. Thank you very, very big much. Pleasure. Big pleasure. Lovely joining you all today. Wish, it was, wish it was in person. <laughs> yes. Well, one day, next year, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Thank in the, you. In the future. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Big pleasure. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.